Hi, my name is uh, Mike Shields. I'm here with the chief of Warminster Police, Chief Donnelly, and uh, me and the chief have been uh, in contact ever since the George Floyd incident. Uh, we've been meeting and uh, talking through text, you know, just trying to make the world a better place in light of everything that's going on, you know, trying to, um, you know, through conversation and dialogue comes education. You know, Chief educates mm -hmm. me on things and, you know, and hopefully I, you know, shed some light education as well too. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I just have a couple questions here for the Chief and, you know, he's, he's been willing and, and open to answering these questions. So, uh, first question is, um, as Chief of the Warminster Police Force, what necessary steps have you taken to educate your guys on racism and police brutality? Okay. Uh, me and Mike discussed earlier, as I give the answers, I'm gonna just lower my mask a little bit so I can speak and people can see it's me actually speaking. Um, but as I was talking talking to Mike, um, Warminster Police through the Bucks County District Attorney's Office in and around early June, after we were done with all the uh, um, rallies and things like that. I reached out to Matt Weintraub of the Bucks County District Attorney's Office. Uh, Matt runs a series of events. He ran one at Bentstown High School. I think he has one coming up at Newtown Solbury, or New Hope uh, Solbury School in early August, which is a movie. It's about an hour, 45 minutes long. It's a uh, driving wild black. Um, it's a video uh, and movie um, that takes it from black man's perspective, several different witnesses who had uh, experienced racism and their experiences with the police officers. Um, then it also integrates um, police officers who have uh, either been fired or gone to jail in reference to their actions as a police officer and violating civil rights and other people's other rights and it gives their perspective and goes back and forth and it's a highly educational movie. Um, as you know, when I uh, released the bias-based policing uh, directive uh, from Warminster Police, uh, I realized, and I've already reached out to Matt about getting that video for my entire department um, and he was gracious enough to give me the li uh, loan us the link so we could watch it. Um, everybody in the department has, ha has had to view that movie um, and if you look at it, there's a short version, a long version. They had to watch a long version. I didn't cut, we don't cut any corners when it comes to training. So we've all watched the long version and I think they've gotten a, uh, a different perspective. Uh, the information I'm getting back from the training lieutenant and the squad supervisors that they, they've gotten a different perspective on how they approach and deal and why the de-escalation that we're training them is important. Right. and how p different people perceive different things based on their experiences in their life and um, their, and what's happened to them. Because when you car stop somebody or you stop somebody, you may have a legitimate, you have a legitimate stop, reasonable suspicion or probable cause to stop the car is the way we train. You don't just stop cars to stop cars. But when you have a reasonable suspicion, probable cause to stop, that person may not be even thinking of it. You know, and your job as a car stop is to bring their awareness back to their driving so that to, so they drive safely. Right. Or, or conduct your investigation on whatever, you know, you see. Because, I mean, we get information constantly through police radio on different things going on. And you may get information on a red Honda. Mm -hmm. You know, and you might not see a red Honda all day, but the minute you get police information on a red Honda, you'd be amazed on how many red Hondas you see in the next 10 minutes. Right. Or things that could look red, you know, from the color of the chairs to bright, you know, red to off-colored red to pink. Mm -hmm. And um, everything kind of matches or is similar and you're looking to investigate it because that's your job. But this gives them a different perspective on what happens when they get up there. Because that person you stop um, maybe having a bad day, could have been stopped three other times, 
um, because you know they forgot to register their their vehicle. You know, in the COVID times and registrations got held back and all that. You know, they might not they they might have already been stopped two times going to work, and they know their registration's bad. You know, they could be having a bad day, they could be having a good day, they could have bad experiences prior with police, with our police department. You know, we're not, we weren't perfect. We're trying to strive and get to be perfect, but, um, you know, we've, we've uh, removed some bad officers from this department in the past, or they went and seek life elsewhere. So, um, we're, that's, that's one thing we were doing. The other thing is that we're, we, I told you we put de-escalation in all our lesson plans. Um, now we're ramping that up even more. Um, getting our de-escalation going, uh, making sure that we're addressing it. Uh, we're re-evaluating our, uh, our defensive tactics. Um, we were getting in, before COVID, we were getting into the de 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 defensive tactics in some versions of uh, a jiu-jitsu, and it was basically scoped around um, what happens if the officer gets mounted or the officer gets someone on top of them right. and they can't get them off them. Right. You know, it, that's the way it was based. Um, due to COVID, that kind of that training had to get postponed. But now with these uh, incidents coming out, you have Mr. Floyd's incident, you have the Allen County incident. Uh, we were talking about a Mount Pocono incident and a, and a, and a sh one that happened down the shore. Um, all those things are now causing us to reevaluate where we're going to go with it. Adding into the de-escalation, adding into um, what we need to cover, um, and then the, the the other thing we're getting into is, as you can see by the paper I was showing, Mike. Um, there's very we have the governor's orders that came out yesterday involving the different changes in police work, reporting, uh, employees, psychological evaluations. Uh, different training the police have to go into uh, a police one article that we were going into in regards to um, how much training goes into police officers and the uh, how minimal it is compared to initial training compared to other professions um, and different states and there's no real standardized national level of what you have to do and what the qualifications are to be professional and then there's a third one here that we didn't get, it's a little lengthy, but it's about harm reduction and policing. And I pulled that just now because in the governor's order, there's a part that talks about or the governor, or the law that the governor signed, not the governor's order, um, about harm reduction. And I wasn't really sure where they were going with, it was kind of a broad topic. So we're doing our research on trying to figure out what we can do within the budget we have and how to best serve Warminster. So those are the things we're working on. They're the top three, if that helps. Okay. All right? Yeah. Right. And uh, in your personal opinion, why do you think people of color are dying or seriously getting injured when coming in contact with the police? That's, that's a, a, a good question. I. I don't know off the top of my head. I tend to think it's some of the the lack of what we just talked about. You know, the uh, the governor's order is or not the governor's order. I keep saying the governor's order because I'm used to the COVID orders, but um, the law that was just written specifies certain levels of training that the Municipal Police Officers Education and Training Commission is going to have to dictate to um, police officers. Now, a lot of these things we've done, or we do already. Um, the bill also, like I said, I'll read it right here from uh, the, law, uh, the thing it says, uh, the bill also requires training police officers in trauma-informed care, which we do, uh, use of deadly force, which we do, de-escalation, which we do, uh, community and cultural awareness, which we just talked about through our bias-based policing, implicit bias, uh, procedural justice and reconciliation techniques, and harm reduction techniques. Now, the only 
one that I that caught me off was harm reduction. When you look it up, it talks more about harm reduction for alcoholism, drug addiction. It's spe it's very specific, but it's written in a broad topic here. So, um, so most of this, we all we we do a lot of it. Do we do enough of it? No, no. We you know less than three percent. Uh, three percent of our t overall time at work is in training. Uh, I think the Police One article hits it very well when they talk about twenty percent of your time should be dictated in training. Um, but that comes with a significant cost. Right. You know, if you're talking twenty percent of your time is required to be in training if you work five days a week you're talking about a full day in training well you have to have officers that replace those officers while they're in training okay. so you're talking about an increase in personnel yeah. which means an increase in health care increase in salary increase in uniform cost increase in vehicles increase in full fuel consumption I mean everything that an officer would touch is probably going to go up, which correlates to more impact on the general fund from the police department. So these are going to come come at a significant cost. Like I said this bill is just signed yesterday, so July fourteenth. Um, I don't know what the impact is. We do a lot of it now. Um, but it just falls short on how much time you're required to put into training. Um, uh, like I said, uh, I was talking to Mike earlier. Uh, one of my officers uh, just did a, a, cl a college paper on the training we do here. Um, and he turned it in uh, to his uh, professor. But he found that we do about 3% overall time of training. Now, I tend to think it's a little bit more because we do a lot of little roll call trainings that are... 10, 20, 30 minutes long that don't necessarily impact on our training reports, which we're adjusting now, right. making sure we're accounting for those 20 and 30 minutes because they add up over a year. If you do two a month, that's an hour more a year over 12 months. It's a full day when you get to the end of the year. So um, those are some of the things that are going on. But why? I tend to think that and the police one article hits it right is that um, different states do different hours. Okay. I think uh, Pennsylvania, I think, is nine, 920 hours. It's almost six months worth of time, seven months worth of time in the academy. Um, but that's just the basic, basic, basic. You know, they, you know, you know some hit the, the skill set that you need, but you're, you're basically taking a position that you. It's one of the few professions, and this article hits it well, is that uh, lawyers have to go to school, they have to have an undergraduate degree, doctors have to have an undergraduate degree, um, accountants have to have undergraduate degrees before they even sit for a test to be certified as that. Um, if this article talks about uh, even cutting hair. Mm -hmm. The people who cut hair have to do more time than some police academies out there. Not necessarily Pennsylvania. Right. I don't know what the numbers are, but when they talk about other states, some other states are only doing 480 hours right. of time. That's right. 10 weeks of, a, of academy training. Right. And then you're gonna give someone a badge of gun and point them out on the street and say, all right, go answer your radio and enforce the law to the best of your ability. Well, right. everybody goes through training different. Um, we talked about before the reason how we do selection is key to us right um, and making sure we pick the right person and part of that is maturity yeah. making sure they're mature they can handle what's going on you know if it's tough to take a 21 or an 18 or 19 year old kid put them through the Academy uh, the 920 hours and say all right go out and have, go out and handle the street and go to a domestic over you know, wherever, Speedway, you know, over by the avenues, over by the Poets area, you know, and go settle this fight between this 52-year-old man and his 52-year-old woman <laughs> that have lived the life. And now you have to give them marriage advice right. and life advice 
okay? And you lived half as long as they have, and probably not even as long as they've been married. Right. You know, they might be married 20 years, and or 25 years, and you're 22, and you're gonna give them marital advice? It right. gets kind of tough that way. And so we look for the more mature people and go for it. But that, in my opinion, selection. Selection, and that goes with your mental health and all the things we talked about before um, is a big one. And then training, the initial training, I think in Pennsylvania is very good. Uh, it's up there state-wise, but the ongoing training, I mean, we, when our guys and girls come out of the academy and we hire them, they spend another uh, 12 weeks, you know, maybe more, 14 weeks, in dedicated field training, which means the first month they're probably inside, they're, they're getting all their, their, their equipment and they're getting all their fire, updated firearm training and defensive tactics training, CPR training de-escalation training, uh, CIT training, anything we can put them in, we get them in, and then they get their uniforms and they go out on the street and then they're with somebody who's an experienced officer and that person monitors them and teaches them and mentors them on the way we want them to be. All right? And that's all dictated from myself, that's dictated from the Board of Supervisors to the manager to me, right down on what they want to see their police department look like and how they want them to act. So, and it drills and it goes right down to those officers. Um, after those 12 or 14 weeks, and we feel that they're, out, they're good enough to be out in a car by themselves and responsible out in a car by themselves, um, they move to, they're still in training. You know, they don't feel like they're not overseen like that, but they're watched by a sergeant, there's reports written, their, their work is scrutinized, almost up for, a good year and then we we they're just incorporated into the ongoing training that all our officers get but there's a cost to train right. and it's a, it's a high cost we try to do a lot of it in-house mm-hmm. some of it's got to go out out, out of the, out of the uh, department where the money that's where the money gets spent so and we talked about budget earlier right. that's a it's a direct impact on everybody out there so those are some of the things that, in my opinion, are not, uh, that are going and making these incidents more brutal and more uh, um, over the top than normal, right. than anybody else, so. so. Now, uh, how do you feel as uh, in our community we can all feel safe in light of uh, all the recent incidents and events that are uh, taking place involving police and people of color. Well, I think safety safety is a, a subjective term. Your safe, it might not be my safe, may not be our safe. Um, uh, but I think we live in a overall, because I live here too, I live in Warminster. I think we live in an overall very safe community. Um, there's a lot of people that come through and go in and out. We have a lot of draw from Philadelphia, Trenton, Allentown. There are three major cities around us. Um, the people that live here, um, the neighborhoods are, you know, we have one or two streets that neighbors might not get along. But overall, all the neighbors get along from, like I said, from the Speedway, from Casey, um, Casey Hills, um, to the poets, to Hartsville. Uh, I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good community overall. I mean, we're busy because we have a lot of people that live here, um, and we have a lot of people that visit here. Um, but to, to increase the safety, um, I think one, everybody's got to be understanding. They have to be, and I say this. It usually comes out around Fourth of July, neighborly, um, or and fireworks are a prime example. Um, people are not considerate, and they are not neighborly when it comes to fireworks. They go off all over, all hours of the day and night, uh, and they they if people. 
people honestly said and looked at who their neighbors were and where they lived and what their neighbors were like, then they might do something different, you know? And not just the neighbors in front of them, the neighbors behind them, the neighbors on the behind, and, and understood what their neighborhood is and, and who lives there. Um, that's, and you talk about a neighborhood watch, that's some of the best neighborhood watch you'll ever, ever get without sending guys and girls and ladies and civilians out on that neighborhood patrol and walking around your neighborhood. You just keep an, odd, an honest, vigilant, caring, neighborly view of your neighborhood and call the police when you see something that's not supposed to be there or that is suspicious and give your name and your address so we have a chance to talk to you and get your point of view, then some of that's going on. But I mean, when you don't pay attention or you have a, an unnecessarily, an unprovoked fear of somebody just because the color of their skin, their ethnicity, um, their race, um, and you don't understand it, um, that might provoke some of, some of this. But understand it, we are a multicultural, multicultural uh, township. Black, white, Hispanic, Asian. I mean, we have everybody living here. Right. This is a, a, a picture perfect melting pot of what's going on in the world. It's not one side of one way or the other when it comes to the demographics. I mean, there may be more or less one way or the other, but we are all working class people that want to go to work, raise our kids, have a good life and be kind and neighborly but sometimes we lose focus you get so caught up in your life you lose focus of what's really going on and sometimes that that gets you so you know broaden your horizons say hello to people be nice ask them if they you can help them in any way and I think that would go a long way to being safe but it would make you safe is comfort right. so if you got to know your neighbors and got to know the people that live around you in your neighborhood yeah. you know who, who the kid the people who play in your kids sports or go to your church or go to your school or in your grade if you know them then you're not fearful and if you're not fearful you're comfortable right. which then leads to your safety okay. your self-imposed safety that you feel safe does that make sense? Yeah, no, okay. that's awesome. Yeah. Right. Good. Now, uh, moving forward, and this is for anyone, just not people of color speak. Uh, if someone gets pulled over in our township, in our community, mm -hmm. and uh, they're truly scared and fearful, what do you suggest that they do? Well, like we, like we've uh, we've discussed on many occasions when it comes to car stops, when you talk about uh, police imposters, things like that. We, we do, we have some very uh, scary sections of Warminster, mainly because of the base. Mm -hmm. The base over at Warminster Community Park, there's no overhead lights, you can't see anything. If it wasn't for Costco, Walmart, and Mission Barbecue, it'd be, you know, when the sun goes down, it's dark. You know, um, over by Schismatic Park, up by Grace Lutheran, or uh, by the golf course, it just gets dark. Um, if you get car stopped and you're, you're scared, um, I would suggest that um, turn your inside, slow down, get in the curb lane, slow down, put your blinkers on, turn your inside light on. If you feel that it's not a police officer behind you or that you're familiar, you can call 911, and that's all audio taped and videotaped. Um, you can pull into a lighted area. Um, gas station Sunoco, which street in Newark, uh, street in Jacksonville, um, street in Davisville. Um, go somewhere there where there's lit. Go someplace where there's a lot of people. Um, depending on the time of day, you, you may find a lot of people. Um, I wouldn't pull behind any place. I would pull in front of it 
because you know, the video cameras are out front. Um, we are um, equipped with in-car cameras and body cameras. They should be on. Um, so our body cameras, I don't have one on now, but there's normally a light on them. During the day, you'll see it a little bit. At night, our we might uh, the officer might subdue the light, basically because uh, they don't want a target on their chest. Um, although that camera should be on, and it should be on pretty much the whole time unless you're talking police tactics or something of that nature or something else comes up, personal comes up, and because that it always happens. Um, but that camera should be running, at least the in-car camera should be running, and that should be running. Um, the officer should come up and tell you who he is, what they're stopping you for, and the reason for their stop. And if you have your identification and have paperwork for the car, um, they are all required, uh, or you, uh, they're able, they're allowed to ask that. Um, to be stopped, you can have reasonable suspicion or probable cause. Um, probable cause, um, the simple reasonable suspicion is you're most likely a, a crime is afoot and they're trying to investigate what's going on. And in some cases, it's not you. You know, you get up on the car, you know, officers can't see, they see just like you and me at night. You know, maybe you see, if you're an older officer, maybe you don't see so well anymore. Right. You know, you can't see through the glare of the car, you can't see through the back window. Um, you know, I wear contacts. I've always had trouble looking through a back window with the glare of the light on it. You know, especially when you put the overhead lights, the headlights, the spotlight, everything else you're looking to see, so you can see in mm -hmm. um, the glares in, in there. When you get up there and you look into the car, oh God, this isn't my person. All right, all right, here, have a nice day, have a nice night, and, and go about your business. Um, but there are some, but if you're truly fearful, you can call 911. They can verify who that is behind you. If you could, as soon as 911 gets on the phone, they're going to ask where you're at. So you should know where you're at at all times. Um, if you're on Street Road, know you're on Street Road. If you're on County Line Road, know you're on County Line Road. If you're on Jackson, York, you know, make sure you know what street you're on. Um, that's a simple tactic that I learned as a young cop. I mean, I grew up in the city, but I didn't grow up in every area that I worked. And an older cop taught me because when you come down the street, before you turn on the street, make sure you look at what sign you're at and what corner you're at and what street you're leaving and what street you're going on to. And it's just something that stuck with me as I, uh, I progress through. So every time I, I drive, I drive and I see a sign, I look, I see where I'm at and I turn. Now, some streets don't have signs, some places don't, but the main ones in Warminster do. And there should be one on every corner. Um, but know what town you're in. I know it's. I know when you get out into Bucks County, um, it's hard to determine where the borders are. I mean, I get lost sometimes in Bucks County. I don't know where I'm at, especially if I go up up County. Um, the farther I get away from the city, the more I get lost. Um, but the um, yeah, know where you're at. Know where you're going. Um, if, and, and get on the phone and call 911. Um, you can always, you know, you can, they always videotape us. We're gonna be videotaped, uh, videotaping back and forth. I think that's going a long way, the implementation of the body cameras, because uh, it just gives you a different view of what's, what's going on, depending on where the officer wears it. Um, we tend to wear ours dead center of our chest just because that's where the mount is. Um, and that gives us the best view on what's going on. Um, uh, but yeah, I would just, again, turn your interior light on, turn your, slow down. So if you're going 45, drop it down to 25. Um, that'll, that'll, the officer should pick up on that. That, all right, something's going on. They're not, a, you're not a, avoiding me as much as you're trying to, either find a good location or you're unsure of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the officer's education, at least it should be. I can tell you that from Warminster. Can't tell you outside of Warminster what they, what they would do, but right. in Warminster that's what I would do overall. All right.
Great. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to thank you for you know just continuing to mm -hmm. have this dialogue with me. Um, we educate one another and also you know just continue to reach out to the, our community. Mm -hmm. So you know we don't have anything you know like the George Floyd incident, which mm -hmm. was tragic. So that you know we don't have anything like that anymore, Mr. Axe. We shouldn't have anything like that ever again. But you know, just if we can all just come together, you know, and educate one another, like you said, get to know your neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, and I truly believe in my heart that even if you don't like another person, you know, like we should still be able to respect one another. You know, absolutely. So, Hopefully, moving forward, you know, we can just continue to have these conversations and continue to enlighten everyone else. Yeah, well, I I appreciate your time because Mike does this for on his own time. He doesn't he doesn't come in uh, on his own time after he works and family things. So I appreciate you coming in and helping us because uh, I'll take what we've talked about today and take it back to my guys and girls, and we'll talk about it and. and See if we can't implement even more come up with new ideas but um i think the follow-through um you know you see a lot of people talk and go forward but there's no follow-up or follow-through right i appreciate you coming in and staying on us and making sure that we follow through with what we're talking about and how we're saying it um so that we can uh, better serve the community so I appreciate your time and your efforts in this, and I, I'll, I'll do this again anytime you want. So I appreciate your time. All right. Thank All right. you, Chief. Thank you, Mike.